my pleasure to introduce Rob. <laughs> say I'm a, a, a Tom Paineite. Um, you know, uh, the older I've become, the less ideological I've become. And, and when asked to kind of summarize my politics, I find myself uh, quoting Tom Paine or perhaps man mangling Tom Paine. But the gist of, of, of the, the one sentence description of his politics really fit mine. And that is, I am a citizen of the world my religion is to do good. Yes. Now, you know, that doesn't sound all that radical, but then you start thinking about <laughs> what that actually means. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's as good a description of my politics as I can give you, and as, as, as was said in, about the, the Talmud, the rest is commentary. Um, anyway, uh, Tom Paine was a champion of the radical, egalitarian wing of the American Revolution, a champion of free speech and of human rights. Um, and I've been asked to speak about my parents' case, WikiLeaks, <coughs> and the Espionage Act of 1917. But I'm actually going to start way before 1917. Uh, I'm going to go back to Tom Paine's time. Uh, I'm going to talk not only about those three subjects I mentioned, but I'm also going to talk about treason, constructive treason, and the American Revolution, as well as the Espionage Act my parents used and the WikiLeaks. And I'm going to do it in that order. Uh, now, why am I going to start with treason? Uh, you know, one way of thinking about what is treason uh, is that treason is dissent that the government classifies as illegal. Uh, you know, and Tom Paine was a dissenter, and so am I, and so were my parents, and so is Julian Assange. Uh, and often the question, when we're contemplating treason, the question is, where do you draw the line? between what is legal and what is illegal dissent. Now, the First Amendment to the Constitution gives us the right to speak our minds, to attack government policy. But when do such attacks become treasonous? Um, well, at the Constitutional Convention, the founders approved a document that defined treason very narrowly. I'm going to quote the Constitution. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. It's actually Article 3, Section 3 of the Constitution. Now, when I read those lines, the word that jumps out at me is the word only. Treason shall against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them, etc. Uh, in plain English, nothing else beyond the words contained in this sentence constitutes treason against the United States. And at first blush, it seems obvious why those who've written that text would seek such a diminished definition. They just rebelled against their sovereign, the English king. Arguably, they'd all been traitors. And so they had become sensitized to the scope of the concept. But you know, like many things, it wasn't that simple. To find out why, we have to go back even further. The definition of treason in our Constitution is a reaction to English law, but it also surprisingly springs from it. 
Treason was first defined in the same limited fashion that appears in our Constitution in the time of King Edward III. That's in 1350. This definition was 400 years old, was more than 400 years old at the time of the American Revolution. And this narrow definition, when it was first adopted or stated, was considered a breakthrough because under it, internal disagreements no longer became the basis of a treason charge. In fact, it was only later that the concept of treason was broadened to include the trail of a light allegiance owed the sovereign, that is, the king. However, as time went on, as things often do with government and the law, it got worse. Uh, it was further broadened and applied very drastically in England and in the colonies via the concept of constructive treason. Now, I bet there are very few people in this room who've ever heard of the concept of constructive treason. What's constructive treason? Well, let me give you an example. If someone opposed a law, perhaps something to do with the tariff, or trade, or some other matter of that kind, government prosecutors could claim before a judge that such opposition weakened the sovereign. A weakened government, they would go on to say, would be more vulnerable to its enemies, and by so opposing this law, the person was, in effect, acting treasonously. You could substitute the word indirect for constructive. It was an indirect treason. And what was the penalty for this supposed crime? Well, it was frequently forfeiture of property. And to make matters worse, many of these decisions were actually written down and recorded as part of English case law and became part of what was called the common law. And that common law set precedence for future cases. Thus, over time, the range of spoken or written statements that people might make that could become constructive or common law treasons proliferated. And those attending the Constitutional <coughs> Convention sought to prevent constructive or common law treasons in the new United States. In other words, the treason clause was adopted in order to prevent the government from criminalizing dissent and labeling those who disagreed with its policies traitors. However, <coughs> the founders weren't Tom Paine radicals, uh, at least most of them. They were leery of treason not only because the term could be used against them for the actions that they took, but also because they were all men of property. And they didn't want the concept of treason to strip them of their assets. They didn't want to have to forfeit their property. Remember <coughs> what the Constitutional Convention ultimately adopted. Only white male property owners over 21 years of age could vote. Now, Thomas Jefferson was particularly worried about the use of constructive treasons. He wrote, quote, we must, by negative words, prevent an inundation of common law treasons. And then finally, the founders cemented the limitation of treason's reach with its First Amendment to make it plain that spoken opposition could never be treasonous. Now, perhaps surprisingly, this actually worked pretty well. <laughs> the effort was remarkably successful for quite some time. In fact, with the exception of the prosecutions under the Alien and Sedition Act during John Adams' presidency, I think it's no accident that he'd suddenly be ele been elevated to some great heroic figure at the time of the Bush administration. Um, there were almost no no instances of the federal government jailing people for spoken opposition to governmental policies until after 1900. The big change came with the passage of the Espionage Act of 1917. What happened? What caused the passage of this act? We entered World War I. 
and the American people, a large portion of the American people, didn't like it. And so the administration decided they were going to pass a law that would criminalize and jail those people who spoke out against World War I. Uh, most prosecutions under the 1917 Act were for violating the first title of its third section. Let me read that to you. Whoever, when the United States is at war, shall willfully make or convey false reports or false statements with the intent to interfere with the operation or success of the military or naval forces of the United States or promote the success of its enemies shall be punished by a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment of not more than 20 years or both. Now, although the word treason does not appear by criminalizing certain types of dissent, it essentially transformed dissent into treason. And the language, not surprisingly, created a flood of court interpretations of the above quoted words. <coughs> to use Jefferson's term, an inundation of common law treason. This resulted in people serving long prison terms for their spoken or written opinions in obvious violation of the First Amendment. Uh, I want to just quote from you, to you from one example from Jeffrey Stone's book, Perilous Times, which was published in 2004. There was a woman named Rose Pastor Stokes. <coughs> she was convicted under the act for saying, quote, I am for the people and the government is for the profiteers during an anti-war statement to the Women's Dining Club of Kansas City. <laughs> Although there were no soldiers present, indeed no men in her intended audience, the government argued that she had violated the act because, quote, our armies can operate and succeed only so far as they are supported and maintained by the folks at home. And Stokes' statement had the tendency to, quote, chill enthusiasm, extinguish confidence, and retard cooperation of mothers, sisters, and sweethearts. She was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Now, think about the chain of logic the prosecutor uses to arrive at this conclusion that the court accepts that ends up with a 10-year prison sentence. It's the same chain of logic that you find in the concept of constructive treason, or common law treason. 